My question concerns the marrow controversy and its relationship to Lordship Salvation. I've been through about two thirds of Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Whole Christ. I'm about to get into the marrow of modern divinity sometime tonight. And what's clear so far is that one, the marrow men were not antinomians by um, any fair stretch of the word. Um, so concerning the relationship between that and Lordship Salvation, I've identified a couple of guys on the internet, I know that's pretty dangerous, uh, who are trying to... That's always dangerous. They're, they're trying to drive a wedge basically between the lordship and anti-lordship positions to say, no, this, is, this, narrow, this position that we have is the traditional confessional reformed uh, position on such things. I wish yeah. I could present you something concrete in terms of what they're saying about lordship salvation, and right. really all I'm getting is it's hard to have assurance when you're looking at your own obedience because you're always going to sin, you're always going to grieve yeah. over your own sin. So I, my primary question is, is lordship salvation, which the term only having existed for like the past 40 years or so, it's mm -hmm. not really the traditional term, but it's, I think it's originally pejorative. It is pejorative. Yeah, it was created pejoratively. Yeah. Um, is there any real difference between the lordship salvation position and what has traditionally been held in reform circles? And the answer to that is no, there isn't. In fact, if you want a great historical set of quotes about the lordship position, get John MacArthur's book, Faith Works, and in the back of that book, there's an appendix mm. with quotes from church history that will give you a full survey of the fact that what the lordship position, let me back up and explain just in case some of you aren't understanding sort of the larger context. When we talk about the lordship position, all we're talking about is what has historically been taught about the nature of saving faith versus what has been taught in some modern circles, particularly here in Dallas, out of DTS, specifically out of Dallas Theological Seminary, specifically uh, the work of men like Charles Ryrie and uh, Zane Hodges and others who have, who have taken issue with that traditional view and said, that's works. If you insist that someone submit to the Lordship of Christ as part of salvation, then you're, you're adding works to salvation. Instead, historically, saving faith, as I defined it even this morning, has been defined as following Jesus. It's having enough faith in who Jesus is that you're willing to follow Him. In fact, Jesus Himself issues these these hard demands to follow him. You must deny yourself. You must, you must refuse to associate with the person that you are. You must say, I want nothing to do with the person I've been. And you must die, take up your cross and follow me. And so you must die to, you must be willing to die literally, but you must be willing to die to all of those things that matter to you and follow me. That's the essence of saving faith. That's what it looks like to follow Jesus. That's what the opponents of that view eventually called lordship salvation. Again, I, I worked through this at length when I taught through uh, James 2. So I would encourage you to go listen to, you know, that section in James 2 where James is dealing with dead faith versus living faith. Right. And I gave one of the messages was on lordship salvation, explaining its background, how did we get the term, what, it, what is this, and is this what the church has always taught? And the answer to your question, for everyone, just to be clear, is the Scriptures have historically taught that the nature of saving faith, the kind of faith that saves, is what its opponents call lordship salvation. It is a willingness to follow Jesus Christ and to confess Him as Lord. doesn't mean you're perfect. doesn't mean you're, you're not going to sin. Obviously, that's a radical position that no one holds. It means there is a willingness in your heart to follow Jesus Christ, to become his disciple. Jesus demanded it for those who, I mean, read, read John. You have those in John's gospel who say they want Jesus, who say they want to follow Jesus, and Jesus calls them into question and says, no, those who are really my disciples obey me. And so, um, Jesus himself identifies, as that, identifies it that way. But back to the issue of assurance. You know, how do we know? Um, it is true that assurance is based on two realities. It's based on our confidence in the gospel promises and our taking the test that Scripture itself gives us of 
our lives, as we're doing in 1 John. It's not either or, it's both and. If all I do is spend all my time reminding myself of the gospel promises, and I don't love other believers, and I don't live in obedience to Jesus Christ, and, and I don't even believe the biblical Jesus and the biblical gospel, I'm not a Christian. So all of my preaching the gospel promises to myself, that's just giving me a false assurance. So it's the combination that gives me genuine assurance. Now, there is a balance. You know, the, the Puritans used to say for every, every uh, one look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. You know, I think that's a, that's a, a pithy way of making a great point, and that is don't concentrate in looking at yourself, looking at yourself all the time. We're doing that as we're going through 1 John, but remind yourself, even as we're doing in 1 John, of the gospel promises. You know, I, I quoted one this morning. I love John 5, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting eternal life and will not enter into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. So I hold on to that promise. I preach the gospel to myself, but at the same time, I look at the tests that Scripture itself gives me in 1 John to, to make sure that that's in check and balance, that I'm not assuring myself of the gospel promises when I'm not genuinely a Christian. So it's that, it's both and, not either or. Every time. Yeah. By the way, that's a great book. Those of you who are readers, I highly recommend, I read it a couple of times actually, Sinclair Ferguson's book, The Whole Christ. 